Welcome everyone to the AI Institute webcast on data monetization. Over to you, Harman, to kick us off. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining Deloitte AI Institute Canada for today's panel discussion on data monetization. A brief introduction about myself. I'm a Deloitte partner focused on helping clients define and execute on AI and data strategies. I help organizations be more insights driven and rely tangible business value through effective use of their data and analytics capabilities. While this event is a webcast, I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of the lands we are on today. Deloitte Canada has offices with representation across most of the country. We acknowledge that our offices reside on traditional treaty and unceded territories as part of Turtle Island and is still home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Lastly, this webcast will be recorded and made available on Deloitte AI Institute webpage. You will be able to view this video in the language of your preference. Uh, before we get started, I would like to set the stage up uh, for the planned panel discussion. Uh, in the recent past, uh, we've seen many forces come together that makes data monetization and enticing opportunities for organizations across all industry segments. First and foremost is the advent of increased data savviness and demand. There has been increased uh, increase in number of data aggregators, marketplaces, and exchanges. The amount of data available to organizations to augment their own data sets has skyrocketed. And with this, organizations have more opportunities to leverage available data sets to generate net positive economic value. Second, uh, data is only useful if it can be stored, analyzed, and transferred security, securely. Cloud technology and privacy preserving techniques continue to mature, allowing for scalable, cost-effective, and secure sharing of data. This is enabling organizations to have appropriate controls in place on data sharing with external parties. Third, there's more clarity on regulations. The direction various regulators across the world are taking is becoming clearer. GDPR, uh, Bill C-27 and 64 here in Canada, and other privacy regulations across around the world are distinctly defining do's and don'ts of using customer-related data. Several regulatory efforts are setting expectations for how data is handled, and this has significant considerations for data monetization. And lastly, data AI capabilities are maturing in organizations of significant number of investments made over the past many years. And with foundational capabilities in place, organizations are exploring how to leverage these capabilities to maximize the investments they've made uh, so far. Uh, with that said, I would uh, love to start this, uh, this uh, panel discussion with, with, a, uh, with a poll question. Uh, you will see the poll question on your screens. Uh, we'd love to know what is the main type of data monetization approach you are planning to explore for your organization in coming year. We've, we've divided, there are six options. Uh, please pick the one that uh, is most relevant for you. There are, the first three are the ones that are more internally focused, and the last three are which is more externally focused. Uh, and with that, I'll kind of encourage everyone to answer this poll, please. We'll give everyone about uh, 30 more seconds to answer. We've seen the uh, results coming in. Uh, I see equally uh, distributed across the, um, more or less, uh, like every organized organization are trying to do a uh, mix of um, many things. I see a lot of uh, organizations trying to improve effic efficiency through better effect, through use of data. I see organizations are thinking about data as a service, insights as a service, as well as uh, collaborative analytics with other organizations as well. Uh, thank you so much for the insights that I've shared with us. Um, 
with this, I will uh, love to introduce uh, you to the panelists that we have in for discussion today. We have an esteemed group of panelists today. I'll briefly introduce them before we start our panel discussion. Uh, first uh, is uh, Tim Rye. Tim Rye is a Senior Vice President, Financial Solutions at Terranet. In this role, Tim is responsible for Terranet's integral property intelligence and collateral management solutions which enables stakeholders across the Canadian lending industry to make confident decisions, mitigate risk, and prevent fraud. Prior to Terranet, Tim has held multiple positions in various banks and technology companies focused on how data platforms and people can work together to drive enhanced effectiveness and new client experiences. Next on our panel is Paul Tsai. Paul is a senior vice president of international, international solutions at TransUnion, a, a leading global information and insights company that makes trust possible in global commerce. He leads uh, TransUnion's product teams across all non-US regions, Canada, Brazil, Latin America, UK, Africa, India, and Asia Pacific. Prior to joining TransUnion, Six years ago, Paul had a 15-year career in banking and primarily credit product leadership roles. Uh, next one uh, is Audrey Ancian. Audrey is a Deloitte partner and leads Deloitte Canada's AI Institute and the AI Academy offering. She focuses on the strategy, process, people dimension of analytics and AI, leveraging her experience as a human capital and process improvement advisor. She has assisted many organizations in structuring building and strengthening their data analytics and AI capabilities. Audrey will also be our moderator for today's discussion. Over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you, Harman. Um, I have to say my background is as an economist. So the topic of monetizing data is on top of, of my list. So really happy to be with you here today, Tim, Paul, and, and Harman, uh, to get this conversation started. Uh, what I'd love to do now is share with you the questions that we've prepared um, and really invite the audience. I see that we have uh, close to 160 attendees. Really wanted to uh, invite you to think about additional questions, complimentary questions. What's been going on in your mind? Don't hesitate to use um, our Q&A function to submit your questions uh, throughout um, the webcast. You don't have to wait for the end. Um, so the first question we'll, we'll start with, we'll, we'll define data monetization, and I'll, I'll invite each panelist to basically complement uh, the definition that Harman was sharing up front and, and tell us what it looks like in the context of their organization. With question two, we'll start thinking about challenges, constraints. Um, what are some of the things to keep in mind as we're trying to maximize, as we're trying to, to extract value from data, monetize it, and, and how do we we'll close with question three on how to get started. So those are the questions that we'll get started with. So let's, um, on the topic of definitions, I would love to ask you, Tim, uh, to basically uh, define data monetization in the Terranet context and maybe give us a few examples of what it means. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first and foremost, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today. An interesting topic, something I uh, really do appreciate uh, talking about. And do encourage all of our participants today to ask questions in the Q&A, because this is intended to be about you as well. For us, data monetization, you know, we really start to think of it as data commercialization versus monetization, and sort of reframing how we approach it. Because when you think of monetization, you automatically go to that dollar and cents, or can I sell something, or what's it worth? And so for us, we really start to define how do we want to commercialize our data, and how do we work with our partners? Um, what are their needs and values, and what, can, what value can it drive? You know, whether that's just the data itself, the, the actual element of the data attribute, um, or workflows or additional products that can be created from those types of things. So for us, it really starts with what value can be created from the asset that we're looking at here in our, you know, in our inventory as well. And really understanding what it is the customer is looking for and the pain points they're solving. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't start off as well by saying when I think about data commercialization, data monetization, an early understanding of the business case drivers. And ultimately, who is prepared and who is willing to pay for this type of data and data access? Because quite often it's easy to get caught up in the hype uh, or of really cool things, but really it does start with the definition of commercialization, monetization, and the problem itself. Thanks for that, Tim, and thanks for sharing your terminology. 
Paul, at TransUnion, what terminology do you, do you use and how do you interpret it? Yeah, so I think uh, Tim touched on a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the same themes or, or, or the way that we look at it, right? So from a TransUnion perspective, you know, we are one of two credit reporting agencies in Canada, us and the, and the other guys. And so from that perspective, you know, you can, you can argue that we get the same raw materials, if you will, right? Um, so for me, I think the way that I think about it is, you know, can you, you know, can you really use that data and how, you know, what can you do with it, right? So I think if I start with the consideration around the data set, you know, I have kind of my four S's of data or data strategy, right? Um, this, is, this is something I came up with myself. So, you know, patent pending, but uh, it's really data uh, suitability, scale, stability, and security, right? The, so those for me, those are the four S's, right? So suitability, you know, is the data suitable for what you're trying to do? And can you actually use it that way, right? So that touches not just on kind of the value that Tim, you were talking about in terms of commercialization, but also from a regulatory privacy perspective, can you use the data for what you want, what you need to use it or what you want to use it for, right? So that's suitability. You need enough of it to be able to really do something and model and, and you know, AI and ML obviously helps with that in terms of, in terms of uh, shortening that or, or shrinking that gap, but, you know, you still need, some level of scale for the data. The data also has to be stable over time so that you can actually, again, create predictive patterns and, and models out of it. You can build stuff out of it. And then lastly, you know, when you start to plug your, when you start to take other people's or plug other systems into your security, obviously is always paramount, particularly with the sensitivity of the data that we use, right? So I think for me, the four S's of data kind of helps to define whether it's good data and usable data. And then data is only data unless you can, build something off of it and at TransUnion we'd like to think that we have a uh, an, en an engineering advantage right so we can build better stuff off of the same raw materials right and I think uh, time and time again with the products that we've launched we've seen that head-to-head -head it beats right so I think that we've got something in the secret sauce there in terms of how what we actually do with the data so um, for me that's really all about data monetization right as yet yeah, can you find value out of the data and what do you what do you do with it when you when you uh, when you do have it right so I think I think um, we're we're probably speaking in the same realm here. Thanks, Paul, for sharing your views and your unpatent framework, which is uh, easy to remember uh, with the four S's. Harman, anything to add to um, the way that Tim and Paul have defined data monetization? Perhaps um, I know you you work across different industries. Is is there a different way of defining or looking at data monetization across different industries? What's your view on that? Um, yeah, from from my from my experience, uh, like serving clients across industries, I would say there are kind of like two categories that are like a lot of organizations think about uh, monetization. One is more internal organization: how you're leveraging your own data sets plus any external data sets that you can uh, uh, get hold of to to for internal purposes, whether it's to maximize revenue, whether it's to uh, reduce the cost, to efficiency improvements, or to mitigate the risk. Uh, uh, that's more internal purposes. And then there's like external focused monetization on how you're leveraging your data sets plus augmenting with third party, third party data or second party data and, and uh, sharing either those aggregated data sets or insights on top of those data sets to other external players who may have an interest in, in, in the insights that you're, you're creating, right? So that one is more in external focus. You're creating net new business models uh, or, or, in, or net new revenue streams for your organizations through, uh, through uh, selling data or insights as a service. Thanks for that, Harman. Um, really would love to move to our second question to build on our definitions with key considerations to reflect on um, as, as we embark on, on a data monetization journey. So I'd love, Tim, uh, to ask you um, if you could share your, your top considerations. Maybe let's start with constraints, right? What are some of the top constraints that um, you've observed and, and perhaps um, you can talk to us about how to circumvent those. Yeah, absolutely. And Paul started to touch that in his answer. And, you know, really one of the things you want to start looking at, in my opinion, is the rights and the permissions to use the data. You know, do you have it? Can you commercialize it? 
you know, in secondaries, it's exclusively yours or is it publicly available and easily replicated, you know, and what level of secret sauce or internal, you know, public eye or knowledge would you have to create to create your own products or ancillary data out of the data sets you, you know, you accumulate. Um, and so it really starts with understanding that level. Of what, what do I have and what can I do with it? And what can I legally do with it? And, you know, going a step further, you know, really asking yourselves the questions as you start to embark upon the journey. Why is it see, my data or my process at this time the one that's going to solve that problem? And that goes back to the definition of a problem. So, you know, when you understand what you're trying to solve and, and where you're trying to go with it, um, you know, do you have the right data? Are you the right partner at that time to come with that solution to your customer or to your marketplace? You know, data is moving fast and something that's competitive advantage today may not be tomorrow. And so really understanding that landscape, not just in the short term, but long term. Um, because typically in the data products, when you're building commercialization and monetization, these are not short-term widgets. You're building solutions or other types of insightful things you hope to replicate and repeat throughout, uh, you know, repeatable processes. Thanks, Tim. Um, Paul, I know you think about data monetization as a, as a process, as having its own life cycle. And certainly it doesn't come all easy and smooth and, and there are some, some hurdles along the way. Talk to us about some of the main constraints and, and how, what maybe what might be your advice for circumventing, circumventing those constraints or challenges along the way? Yeah, I think, I think Tim, Tim makes a good point as well being anchored to the outcome, to the problem and the outcome, right? Um, I was actually at a session uh, for our cards advisory board uh, earlier this week, and we were talking to a, a data company in the health sciences space, and uh, he had some really great advice uh, to say that, you know, if you're thinking about the solution, you're probably lost, right? Always mm -hmm. anchor yourself to the problem and the outcome that you're looking for, and then the solution kind of works itself out, right? So I think I think anchoring yourself to that is is a is a really great uh, is a really great call out, Tim. Um, I think from a process perspective, I think that data monetization is actually a pretty big term, right? I mean, from my experience, you know, there there is a life cycle to it, right? There are the players in the data capture and aggregation space. There are, you know, players in the taking that data and categorizing it and turning it into something that's actually usable. Then there is a first step of kind of turning that into something usable, which is typically attribute building and, you know, kind of like the one layer up. And then there is a step of, taking those attributes and actually turning them into scores and analytics that, again, is its own muscle, if you will. And then there's kind of the final step of distribution, right? So you can have all of that processed and packaged, but you got to get it out, right? Um, and so I think that if you take the term data monetization as it, at its face value, those are a lot of things along a life cycle that you've got to be really, really good at to be able to get full value out of it, right? So I think one of the top considerations is, you know, if you've got the need, then where do you play, right? What do you what are you really good at? And so I would say, depending on what your organization does, depending on your skill set, I would, you know, pick where you want to play and then maybe uh, build by, you know, build by partner, right? Like kind of that type of framework around the other steps that you might need to actually get to the dollars, right? So uh, yeah, for me, I think I think being clear on those two things will really help from a consideration perspective before you jump in. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Harman, over to you to talk about constraints. Like when I think of some potential constraints for folks listening, I think data silos, data governance, or lack thereof, like those are pretty big hurdles to, um, to circumvent. What's your perspective on um, top constraint and, and where to get started on solving for those? Yeah, um, yeah adding on to uh, what uh, Tim and Paul said around, uh, like understanding what uh, does this or real kind of problem that uh, any organization is trying to solve for, or what is the gap in the market that you're trying to solve for, uh, by providing some additional kind of insights or data that uh, that that will solve those problems, right? But from constraints perspective, it comes down to a lot of the foundational capabilities that needs to be in place in an organization uh, that enables uh, data sharing across boundaries, right? Organization boundaries. There's got to be. Uh, like we talk about privacy by design a lot. I think it, it's, it's a lot applicable in this case uh, uh, where you have to make sure that any data uh, that's, that's leaving the organization, it's, it's abiding by any kind of privacy constraints as well, right? Those capabilities have to be in place. Uh, you, you have to be 
one has to be very, very uh, careful around uh, making sure that the data is appropriately masked if it need to be masked uh, or obfuscated if it needs to be obfuscated or filtered out if it needs to be, right? All those foundational capabilities to make sure that the data, whatever data is crossing the organization boundary is, is, is appropriate. Makes sense. Thanks, Harman. Um, we have a sub question um, here, which is around who should be involved in the decision making um, when it when it comes when we're planning for data monetization. And, and there's also a question from um, uh, from the audience around leveraging revenue sharing models to reward and, and incentivize data contributors. I was hoping that our panelists could comment on the concept of who's the data monetization team? Like who should be involved? Um, and, and how do we make some of those, those tough decisions? How do we influence, uh, reward, incentivize some of the stakeholders that are part of that either ecosystem or, or journey? Uh, Tim, your perspective on the team. Yeah, for us at Terranet, the answer is really everybody because data really empowers everything that we do. And, and you know, it might seem simplistic to say that, but you know, we have everything from frontline people who are doing data entry into platforms. And some of that can be automated, fixed, made faster, made easier, or aggregated from the connection source, you know, in terms of efficiencies. Um, but a data strategy is really a corporate strategy. You know, it's a living, breathing organism. It's always evolving. It's fast moving. Uh, it is partially regulated. There's lots of government potential for open banking and changes as we go. And so for me, it is a, it is an enterprise strategy. You know, you have to involve everybody who's starting at the front, who may be entering, creating, or driving incoming data sets, to the finance teams who have to help with the commercialization, understanding of you know inflows and outflows. Uh, for us as well, we do a lot of government data and registry data and uh, personal property, uh, as well as personal sensitive customer consumer data information packets. So things like risk security, platforms and controls uh, are all groups within our organization that we bring to the table and do thorough risk assessments and engagement discussions with. And I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't say our customers. We openly talk about our, our data, what our challenges are with our customers. And that could be workflow challenges, that could be data access, it could be insights, it could be trending, it could be benchmarking against peer groups or you know, some other thing they're looking at. We think with the unlimited possibilities of, of where it can go, we really keep this at the forefront of our discussions at leadership tables, as well as employee sessions. We encourage our employees to look at data flows, workflows, uh, data capabilities, and provide suggestions and enhancements. Uh, and I would also call out the architecture team. You know, data is, is something that has to be grown, massaged, managed. It's not a one and done. You don't put it in database like you used to back in the 90s and access table and run different queries and link them together. You know, it really does require a long-term planning strategy. So I encourage anybody to, to bring a holistic approach and anybody involved in the organization to the discussions. And then articulate some paths as to who has ownership and clear ownership of each of the key accountabilities to do that commercialization exercise uh, and go to market strategy as you think about going further in your process. I don't know, Paul, anything you'd add to that perhaps? Yeah, no, I think you've nailed it, right? It's a team sport, right? Because at the end of the day, data is, um, again, it's, I think it sounds simple, but it's highly complex and you need domain experts in each of those things bringing their unique point of view, right? So from uh, you know we talked about suitability earlier right you need you need your legal team to be on top of that right um and you need the appropriate control framework to compensate right and, and make sure that both from an internal but as well as from a customer perspective that you're checking all the boxes to make everybody feel feel secure in, in terms of uh in terms of being able to access and do the, the things you need to do with the data um yeah from a from a you know i come from a product space right so but um, products tends to be at the center of it. You do need legal sales to give you that voice of market, vo voice of customer technology to talk about data ingestion. And you're right, not just planning for today, but for the future operations to make sure things are, you know, are, are moving along the right way, right? So definitely a team sport where you need everybody playing their role and and, and that domain expertise within, within that consideration. Um, I think that, you know, kind of in my experience working with a, with a broad set of, of different types of customers, you know, uh, I noticed that, you know, say fintech typically are great with the tech, but then sometimes need help with the fin, right? So, you know, so again, and, and that's where I think that's where you draw on the knowledge of both people internally and externally to help round out your thinking on it, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe the last, uh, the last thing that, uh, last point I'd make with that in terms of, in terms of thinking through those constraints, 
is uh, you mentioned it, right? Kind of long-term planning, right? From uh, from uh, the way data is changing, the way that the nature of data is changing, the way you ingest it, and also your capacity to both receive and deliver it. You know, we're in a, in a, my in my role uh, in international, I get to see what's going on in India and the Philippines, for instance, yes. right? Where the Philippines has grown three hundred percent from a credit perspective. India has been, you know, uh, toward pace of they're they're going to do over thirty percent growth again this year, right? So those are you know, like from a Canadian context, you know, we see growth probably in the high, high double, di uh, sorry, low uh, double digits or high single digits. But, you know, as you're planning for these things, yeah, you got to plan, plan ahead for, for, for your own success, right? So. Makes sense. Thanks for that, Paul. Harman, anything to add on the team dimension? I, I would say that uh, in addition to what uh, Tim and Paul said, right, uh, there's this uh, uh, growing interest and in, uh, making sure that the data is being ethically used as well. So we see a lot of uh, organization putting a lot of emphasis on uh, making sure that whatever data they're leveraging for whether internal or external monetization perspective, they are they're using it morally or ethical within the ethical kind of framework of that organization. So it's, it's not just uh, abiding by the regulations, but their own ethical stance of the organization as well. So what, that's one thing. Uh, and, and as like Tim and Paul said, right, it's, it's a multi-player sport, uh, not, just, uh, not just the control groups, whether it's uh, legal privacy, uh, there is like a data technology folks, data architecture folks, uh, like chief data analytics uh, officers, all, all have to come together to make this a reality. Sounds good. Thanks for that. Um, measuring success. How do we measure success from our data monetization, data commercialization efforts? Tim. You know, measuring success really does differ and vary by what your objectives are up front. You know, the simple answer would be achieving the business case objectives you set out to achieve when you started the project. You know, and that would be just a, a corporate commercial answer. I wouldn't want to just give it that. Um, success really, you do have to have KPIs and benchmarks. So what are you trying to achieve? What problem are you trying to solve? How do you plan to get there? What are the stages and steps? You know, if you've identified gaps in your data set, what are your gates and stages to go and acquire those? And why would you do it? And how would you do it? And all those types of things. So for me, data, this is no different than any other product you were running a product organization. You know, you have data is a product. It's leaving, breathing. It needs people to focus on it and nurture it and care for it and have plans and progress against it. Uh, and so it really does depend on your organization, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but I would encourage anybody who's starting on the journey to set specific gates and stages and, and metrics to know you're on track. Um, you know, an example in our businesses, one of the products we're known for is our automated valuation model, a home AVM. So what is my house worth? Right? And, and that's important to a consumer who's wanting to sell their home. It's important to a realtor wanting to list a home. It's important to a lender who wants to loan against that home. You know, the valuation of the home drives very important calculations in the home buying process. And so for us, we have different ways of measuring success. You know, it's the accuracy of the outputs at the end of the day and the value, but we have all kinds of different metrics. What weightings we put on different data sets, what data sets are there, and how do we know we're competitive in those types of things? And how do we benchmark ourselves? And so we do actually set up very specific tracking and metrics and KPIs that allow us on a product by product or a cost by cost basis to determine how successful we are. Um, because quite a bit, you know, as Paul said, it's not just you own data sometimes, you're buying data, you're aggregating data, you're accumulating data, you are using a customer's or partner's data, augmenting it and creating new opportunities or insights from that. And so, you know, it really is about having a plan, a metric, and a KPI that you can track to, monitor, uh, and, and know that you're on track to achieve whatever it is the objectives are for your specific business. Thanks for that, Tim. Really appreciate it. Paul, how do you define how do you measure success at TransUnion when it comes to data monetization? Uh, yeah, I mean, from a, uh, pr probably the same way, a lot echoing a lot of what Tim said, right? I think it's what you're trying to do with the data, right? If the data is there to build a new score, then it's the efficacy of that score relative to similar scores, right? Um, that's why I think you need to be specific on your use case, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that um, data is raw materials, right? That you can take to do many many different things, right? So um, yeah, so I think that there's there's an aspect of it that is, um, if you're looking to build a fraud score, are you able to mitigate that fraud properly? And are you able to build a system that, that you know, is continually um, kind of adjusting and, and, and is able to kind of meet the, meet the needs of that market, right? Um, 
that at the end of the day has there has to be a market at the end of it by the way when we're talking about dollars and cents so that scores and that data and that score is only as good as how much people are willing to pay for it right um, yeah. i think there was a question around um there was a question earlier around like rev share and different models of that yes yeah, so mm -hmm. absolutely that is totally common in the industry right to say okay you you bring ai capabilities and and better modeling on this side we bring the data right so why don't you build the model we supply the, the data and we both get paid out of it right so um yeah so that is common and that's where again kind of being very precise on the business case and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to get out of it is is critically important thank you paul harman your views on measuring success um, again, it depends on like what the, what the organization focus is, right? Like whether it's internally, uh, internal monetization or external, like what I, what I'd say is there has to be, uh, what, what we call like benefits realization kind of like standard methodology or framework put in place in organization. So you can, for each of the uh, product or service that you're offering or the use case that you have, um, uh, like AI use case that uh, you're executing, there you can you can measure value consistently over time. Uh, uh, so so there has to be some kind of framework of sorts. And obviously like metrics depends on, like what success metrics depend on a specific use case or a product or service that you're offering. Uh, so you gotta, you're gonna have like a proper thought put in place upfront on defining what those success metrics gonna be and measuring it consistently, right? So to prove the value of the investments that's going to these uh, efforts. So maybe what I'll add too is that there's a difference between value creation and value capture, right? Yeah. So you can create value all day long and burn money creating value, but unless somebody's willing to pay for it and you're able to go get, capture yeah. that value, yeah. right? Right. We tend to think about value as like a thing, but yeah, there is creating it and there's also capturing it and capturing it is just as important, right? 100%. Well, what, what, I, what I would say is, uh, I think, like I've seen a lot of organization test the market with the like small kind of a MVP of a product that they're offering, making sure there's appetite in the market for such a product or a service uh, to kind of prove that there is a there is a there is a need in the market, right? So, like to your point, uh, you don't want to create products or services for the sake of it. There's got to be market for it as well. Sounds good. Um... Why don't we go in, into our last question that we prepared, and then we can go um, and look at the questions that the audience submitted to us and respond to those. Um, so how, how to get started? What would be your guidance, Tim, to folks that are on the line, uh, either looking to monetize internally or externally? What would be your words of wisdom for them at the start of their journey? It's a tough one, you know, and at the end of the day, it is just get started. Um, Sometimes when you think about data, data commercialization, or what value do I have, or how can I aggregate value or combine and create unique you know, insights or, or outputs from this data, it can seem overwhelming or daunting at times. Um, you know, I go back to our AVM example here. We have you know, millions of data elements that come into our AVM modeling every single year, and it seems quite daunting. But when you break it down to small subsections and understand that certain are property details, certain are marketplace details, certain are realtor details and all these different elements, and you can find different use cases and sources to find that data. And don't get caught up in business as usual. This is how it's done or this is the source. It is amazing when you look out there what has evolved in the last five, 10 years, the availability of data that you couldn't get just two years ago, whether that's public data, consumer data, purchase data, free data, there is a vast amount of data out there. Not only is it out there, it is much more readily available through interconnected platforms and systems. And so I would encourage people to do a lot of research before you just dive in and start building things. You know, we've talked about having a plan and how do you get started? And I'll think about an example we had internally is during the COVID times, we were doing a lot of work to figure out where are customers moving to and from? You know, where they're leaving Brampton, they're going where? They're leaving Burlington and going where? They're going from Calgary to North, South, East, West. And we partnered with a credit union provider, uh, you know, partner of ours. And we looked at things like, well, if we can get the data feed of where they've moved to and the date of move, and we can look at the actual transactions, we can start doing patterns and realtors would be interested in that. But it turns out they wouldn't, they were interested in it, but they wouldn't pay for it. And so, you know, how do you get started? It's about identifying what's your use case, what's the problem you're trying to solve, and why am I the right person? Whether that's the data you have, the insights, the intelligence, the IP, whatever it is, uh, to solve or get started on this problem today, and then just start. 
Um, but don't get too far to you bring in your customers, your partners, or uh, experts like Deloitte if you need to help understand the gaps that you have. That, that's a good point, Tim, because I think we're talking about extracting value from data, which is which mm -hmm. is a foundation and great, but also uh, uh, extracting value from the process or the the insights. Um, I think it goes it goes it goes much further than looking at uh, at at data. Uh, Paul, what's your your view on how to get started in, in light of everything we've chatted? Yeah, I think we touched on it a couple of times uh, earlier, right? It's what's the need that you're trying to solve, right? What's the need you're trying to address? What's the problem you're trying to solve, right? Because like we talked about, even you know, we talked about kind of the sheer amount of data, the sheer, you know, the ability, the, the use cases, those things are changing and expanding every day. At the end of the day, you have to be rooted strategically in what is the thing you're trying to solve for and where is the value there? And then everything else kind of becomes, you know, uh, flows out of that decision, right? So, um, and validate that that truly is a need and something that, you know, that there is value in, right? So I think that's where you start. Sounds good. And Harman, I realize that we have folks on the line that are from public sector organization. So for them, the term monetization may not be the right one. Maybe it's about extracting value. I wonder if you have thoughts of how to get started with extracting more value from data in the public sector context. Um, I think uh, like in public sector, like highly relevant, uh, there are a lot of use cases, like we don't like in public sector, you don't think about like in dollar terms, you think about like what additional, how you can make citizens' life a bit easier, right? You can provide a better experience to the citizens of a particular municipality, province, or, or country, right? So so there are a lot of uh, examples where uh, not just the data that uh, public uh, sector companies have, uh, how it could be augmented with additional data sets, whether it's satellite imagery, or uh, like uh, other other data sets to provide some of the services a bit better, right? Like I've, we've seen a uh, lot of lot of interest in public sector organizations, ministries around providing better services to citizens. A lot of investments in in using data and in analytics insights to 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 help uh, make their lives a bit easier, right? So it's it's monetizations from that citizen experience perspective. Less about ministries trying to create net new revenues from the perspective. And to double click maybe, Harman, if we may, um, there was a question around use cases for higher education. Any use case come to mind if we are thinking higher education and how to monetize data in that context? Um, nothing comes to mind, Audrey, at this point in time, but but happy to kind of take it, take it, uh, take it back and uh, like, uh, uh, do a research on this one and, and share the perspective with, uh, with the audience. Sounds sounds good. We also have uh, uh, Dipti's name uh, there, so can follow up with you specifically. All right, um, Paul, uh, Tim, I'm wondering whether you can uh, share with us either additional examples of revenue uh, sharing agreements that you've used as an incentive, um, or if you could help us answer the question that was looking at um, demystifying the difference between data as a service and data as a product. Tim? Maybe I'll leave the one on data as a service and data as a product for Paul, because I know uh, that's a lot of your area of expertise. Um, you know, one of the areas I think about when I think about data that is probably interesting to talk about is limitations of partners and limitations of uh, the Canadian environment. And Paul, you touched a bit on some of the international things you've seen. And, and in my career, I've had some opportunities as well to look around the world at different processes, workflows, open banking or open data standards that are, are maybe more advanced than in our country. Um, some of the opportunities I encourage people to think about is, in fact, our systems here in Canada and some of the core systems used by large enterprises, organizations, whether you think about the uh, telcos, the infrastructure companies, the banks, uh, governments, and I saw a question about governments, a lot of these are using very older systems. And I don't want to use the word archaic, that's, that's not maybe not fair, but, you know, older in the case that they maybe not are as modern or as available to use the data sets that are available to them. And so I personally believe as consumers, there's lots of inefficiency in the environment around us and things like open banking that's talked about and studied and, and reported on uh, in part isn't moving as fast as it could because it is technically very difficult to actually do some of the things that we would like to do as a country and as an organization and that is underpinned by, you know, lots of legacy years of old systems. So when you think about data, 
there is a huge world around the connectivity of it, the enablement of data access. And that also comes with permission and control. You know, I saw some questions around consumer access and, and I, in the last few years, have spent a lot of time trying to understand where my personal data is and subscribing to things like dark web monitoring, just to understand how far has it gone and where did it go to? And it, it is really interesting. So when I think about data, I do think that in Canada, we have a lot of, of opportunity ahead of us, specifically tied to just the integration and the accessibility of the data, as well as, of course, the insights and opportunities can be derived from it. But uh, Paul, I pass over to you maybe for your comments on that as well. Yeah, I think um, so. I think if if we touch on kind of the the question around data as a service and data products and trying to demystify, so um, I haven't come across the data as a service uh, kind of model as much. But I think if you if you break it down to again, kind of this whole data life cycle and like where 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 can people play and where where are the pools of value, right? So there is definitely a um, there is definitely a uh, call it data aggregation and, and cleansing step to it, right? So there are, there are these bodies that come and take the data in and go find new data and then put it together, clean it up and make it usable. Like TransUnion does, that's probably the core of our business and, and Tim probably the same with TerraNet, right? Like that's kind of the core of it. And then you have the, um, what do you do with that data? In which case data as a product, I would say probably, yes, you do, you can sell raw data, right? Um, again, you have to be, you know, you have to be careful with the purpose and, and how you how you provide it and, and all of that stuff. But yes, data can be a product. Um, I would say probably from a value perspective, what you do with the data probably gives you better margins, right? Because data, like you can't pay, you, you do, you should get paid for the work of putting the data together, cleansing it, because that is technology and resource intensive. But then again, kind of incremental value accrues, the the more and better sophisticated things you can do with that, uh, with that data, right? So yes, you can sell data, but I believe that, you know, the more you can do with it and the more sophisticated you can get with it, obviously that's where value accrues. Um, and I guess the other question, you don't have, you don't have to do all of that yourself, right? There are other organizations that can, that may do it better than you, that may provide, that may bring capabilities to the table that you can't bring yourself. And in which case, again, it's very common to say, you know, rev share, right? Okay, um, you own the model, I own the data, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, and let's split it 50-50, right? Like, I mean, that's a, you know, that type of... Uh, <clears throat> That type of a model that happens uh, happens all the time and is is uh, prevalent in nature. Thanks, Paul, for helping us demystify between those two terms. Uh, Harman, I'm hoping you can help us get started to answer a few questions we've had had on data ownership. Uh, so, a few questions. I'll start with uh, data ownership is key before embarking on a data monetization journey. Any tips on, on tackling that? That was one of the first questions we had. There's also a question that is reflecting on the trend in, uh, in society where you know we individuals, Tim was hinting at it, um, how is my data being treated? I'm the data owner. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on, on data ownership? Uh, so I'll, I'll try to answer this one like in two ways, right? Number one is more broader this, uh, uh, discussion around like who owns the data, like customer themselves, or is it the organizations that the customers are uh, uh, dealing with in, in a particular, let's say, banks, right? Uh, I think the, the around a lot of regulations are are kind of dictating these days on who actually owns the data, uh, and uh, and uh, and what organizations can do with the customer's data as well, right? Like there's a lot of consents. Uh, that are being put in place around, let's say, our bank with a certain uh, certain bank here in Canada, like what they can and cannot do with the data that uh, that uh, they have on me, right? Uh, so that's a, like a lot of this regulatory driven. Uh, but once, let's say, the data is sitting in an organization, like within an organization as well, there are multiple stakeholder groups, whether it's technology, chief data officer organizations, uh, and whatnot, right? Like there's there's usually a, a debate going on within the organization as well, like who indeed owns the data, right? And the answer that we usually, uh, a lot of organizations are going the direction that eventually it's the, it's the business stakeholders who, who understand what the data is all about. And that's where the ownership reside, which is enabled by technology, data organizations and whatnot, right? So that's that would be my perspective on ownership. Uh, 
yeah, like any anything uh, else to add, Paul, Tim, from your perspective, based on your experience? I can maybe add a real world example for people on the call when you think about who owns the data and, and the problem I've, I've faced with my entire career in the mortgage lending space as we've worked with different customers. So think about your, as a consumer, if you go to a realtor to purchase a home, you're going to fill out a, an agreement to work with that realtor. And you'd be surprised what consent you're giving to the realtor in that capacity. And they have the right now to give your data to home inspectors and all kinds of other people, load it into MLS listing services and up to their parent co. And then typically they're going to refer you to a mortgage broker. And then you sit down with a mortgage broker and you sign a consent form. And that mortgage broker now has consent to use your data, pull your credit bureau, engage other third-party partners, and in fact, transmit your data to as many lenders as they see fit for the purposes of getting you a mortgage application. And many smart ones will in fact tell you that they have gave now consented for the next five years for them to pull TransUnion credit bureau updates to help monitor your financial situation and give you refinances and all that stuff. And the lender who funds that mortgage will turn around and say to that broker, I funded that mortgage. I now own the customer. Stop marketing, a, you know, refinance. I, I want to work with that customer. Now I have the product here. And in all those cases, it comes down to the use case. Every single, and, and sorry, beyond that, you have the lawyer and the closing people and the funders and all those other people that go with it. And the truth is every one of those people have legal rights to use your data in multiple ways, multiple purposes, and often for commercialization efforts. And so when you think about that exact example, the lender would say they own the customer and the customer data because they now have the product. The broker will say, well, I have the right to market to them. The broker will say, well, I have the right to get them to buy and sell a new home. And your data is now spread everywhere. So it really is interesting when you say who owns the data. The end consumer will ultimately say it is them. And I personally believe it is my data. It is my right to my data. But that we don't have a lot of systems or controls in place. Or we as consumers don't have tools or technology to actually track, see, and monitor where it goes. And I think you will see some of that evolving in the years to come. But, uh, you know, it's just interesting to think about the data ownership and control. What can you use it for and how can you use it? It comes down to what you've got consent for. What does your user agreement, your VAT, your VAR, whatever it is in terms of using in your industry, allow you to do and for how long? I'd also say that's really important because if you're accumulating a data set from a third party and applying all your IP, and I've seen this in my history and, and some smaller companies make mistakes, they only have it for two years and they really put IP behind it. And that comes up and the cost of that data goes up exponentially, or they can't get it anymore because somebody else has figured that value. So that goes back to just that long term. You really have to understand what, why, how, what's the permission, what's the use case and why you're the right person to do it. Bit of a long answer, but Paul, I'll pass that to you as well. See if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think you nailed it, right? I think, I think that if you, I think ultimately, I, I, I believe ultimately the consumer, like you own your own data. So you're absolutely right, right? And I think our regulatory regime and privacy regime honors that, honors the, the point that at the end of the day, it is that like you as a consumer, you as a Canadian, you own your, that's your data. But you also hit the nail on the head where through that process, many people have the legal right to use your data at, for commercial purposes and to extract value out of that data. So actually both of those things exist and are not necessarily in contention with each other. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think, and I think there is a point of, you know, who's owning, who owns the data versus who's money, making money off the data, I think are two separate points, right? And I think that, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I believe that the consumer owns it. We live within those regulations today and those privacy, uh, that, that privacy regime. And I think that's to keep uh, the end consumer, you know, safe. But yeah, but by the same token, I think um, that's the way that the market works. And that's the way that, you know, commercial value is, is extracted is that there are many players along the chain that, uh, that monetize that today. Thanks, Paul and Tim, for responding to that question. Uh, we have a, a few more that have come in. Harman, I'm hoping you can help me answer Robert's question, which is around, uh, do you see private companies providing detailed data to government regulator to create their own product or to monitor, monitor their product services for safety and regulatory adherence. Is, is that a scenario that's possible? Um, definitely possible. Like I haven't seen this uh, happening in the industry though. Like I've seen private companies kind of coming together uh, to, to create some economic value, which, uh, which is, over and above if they try to do things on their own, right? Like we've seen a lot of use cases around, let's say, fraud monitoring. Uh, there's there's a big use case around collaborating, like multiple organizations collaborating on based on the data that they have and running better analytics for better fraud monitoring. 
right? There are, are there are certain use cases where private organizations are collaborating, but I haven't seen uh, them sending like a detailed data element level kind of information to to other parties, whether it's governments or others, to create uh, or provide services. Sorry, I haven't, I haven't seen that in the market yet. Tim, Paul, anything from your end? On that question? No, not unless their legislator or regulator requires it typically, right? It's not something that uh, people would volunteer. Um, but I think, you know, everybody here agrees better to be on the good side of a regulator than not. So, you know, so I think, you know, cooperation at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day is, uh, does make sense. I think, you know, maybe the closest thing that we, that we observe would be kind of something like FDX or kind of the, the open banking uh, groups that are trying to get ahead of the technology standards and trying to kind mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, trying to get ahead of the regulation a bit or, or, or having something enforced upon them um, and trying to, you know, the industry trying to get ahead of it by showing cooperation and showing a better, you know, kind of leading from the front there. Uh, that's probably the closest thing that we've seen. All right. Tim? Yeah, when I think about the regulatory world, I would agree. It's, it's really about if you're mandated or required to, and you know, there's always the use cases for that. Um, there are examples, though, I think, where they're maybe supporting services, maybe not maybe revenue generating. I think an example at Terranet, uh, we do a lot of PPSA, personal property protection for banks, lenders, auto captives across the country. What that simply means is if somebody does an auto loan, we actually do the PPSA, typically registration on behalf of that lender. And one of the services we offer is we actually offer a free database to CBSA, the Canadian Border Services. And so if an individual is attempting to go across the border and declaring they're going to move there or change residency, the CBSA can for free tap into our database and just see if there's a lien against that vehicle. Now, we don't action that. What we do is we notify the lender for the potential risk on their assets. So there's an example of where we are providing some data with permission, of course, from our customers to assist in fraud prevention and or we would call it public safety in that case. Um, but it isn't about regulatory adherence in this case. Uh, we do, however, with our customers' request, provide lots of data insights and portfolio assessments that they in turn would provide to regulators uh, as they are required as a bank act or as part of the banking environment. So, you know, as a data provider to the housing mortgage lending space, we do provide a lot of data and insights uh, when contracted to and commercially, you know, reasonable to do so to all the different groups as required. Thanks, Tim. Great examples. Um, Harman, I'm wondering if whether you have a view on whether blockchain technology will eventually allow consumers to properly track how their data is being used. Any predictions? <laughs> well, well, that's an, an interesting uh, connection here. Uh, uh, Potentially, like I haven't seen anything happening in the in the market as of now, where blockchain is being used uh, to kind of track ownership of uh, of the data, right? As we we're talking about earlier, uh, and where the data is being used for, right? But uh, but I can definitely see this like a, uh, like a use case that's worth exploring for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and for Tim and Paul, um, would love to ask, as data continues to play a pivotal role in driving economic growth, what emerging trends or technology excites you the most? Let's go with uh, Tim. You know, for me, it's about the opportunity that it's going to bring from a pure consumer and personal experience perspective and the movement of data and what's going to start to be able to happen and the you know, friction from processes that can probably be removed and reduced. I use the home buying experience, for example. I mean, it's just so painful to have to go through that process if you've ever gone through it. Um, so I think that data will continue to really start to come into more real world applications and life automation, and you're going to see more trends that focus on optimizing the human's experience or the way in which they consume different types of services. Um, buying a vehicle, buying a home, typical transactions that are very intensive in-person based will become digitized more and more. And, and you're seeing some of those trends around the world. So for me, you know, I do think that data playing a pivotal role in economic growth will be focused a lot on consumer experience and design and how, you know, things will get faster, easier and more accessible. And uh, it'll be an interesting future for sure. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, uh, what excites you the most? 
Yeah, I think I think it's. And by the way, I'm you know again prior to joining TransUnion, I was like 15 years as a as a, a as a banker in credit, right, running credit shops. So I think credit inclusion and the the enabling force that data will drive towards credit inclusion is is mm-hmm. you know the most is the most exciting thing for me, right? I think if you look at kind of in Canada, we're we're obviously a very mature market, and so you know you kind of lose sight of the fact that there's you know over 500 million people. If, if you add up India, South Africa, Asia Pacific, that could potentially, you know, that are today, you know, are, are, are people that need help getting, you know, getting included into the financial ecosystem, right? Um, about half of that are people that, you know, are credit invisible. So they have no footprint at all, or they have nothing at all from a credit perspective. And some are, th- you know, thin file, if you will, that, that are very hard to adjudicate today. So I think that as data emerges and as we're able to use that data for the purpose of credit inclusion, that automatically drives significant growth, uh, both for that individual and into those communities and countries where you'll start to see, you know, rapid expansion the same way that we've seen it in other markets, right? So I think I think data for credit inclusion pur- purposes is, is something that's really exciting to me. Nice, thanks for sharing. Um, Harman would love your views on that as well. And if you can help me answer, uh, in a minute or or two uh, to the last question that was submitted around, you know, how can we affect it in a world of disruptive of disruption, right? And fast changing technology, how can we prepare ourselves for um, for the, those disruption and, and embrace potential employment transformation? Uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, like understanding what change is coming, right? Like uh, there's a lot of uh, new technologies uh, that. Uh, that are, are changing the way we work, uh, changing the way we engage with uh, uh, with uh, like all our service providers, whether it's in personal life, professional life, or, or what's not, right? So it's, it's uh, understanding what change is coming and preparing yourself uh, to make sure that you're always staying on the cutting edge, right? Like there's a lot of, uh, lot of talks about uh, Gen AI uh, and how it's gonna transform uh, now the, the various uh, products and services uh, in in the industry. Uh, so it's it's understanding um, like how what change is coming, plus how how like we as individuals, we as employees, uh, can can uh, leverage that uh, that uh, transformation change that's coming uh, to to the best advantage of ourselves, and how we can add additional value on top of what's uh, what's uh, what's going to be uh, handled by the machines if we can use it. Down. Sounds good. Harman, Tim, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your perspective on data monetization and more, because uh, we, 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 did, we did go um, uh, over this, this topic and, and on the sides. Uh, would love to capture your data points and, and tell you how we're going to use it. Uh, we use these, um, <laughs> these surveys uh, to improve on our e Institute webcast and identify also topics uh, for future webcasts. So if you want to use the chat function and let us know of any other topics that um, would be of value to you, I'm happy to consider those. But in the meantime, do give us uh, your, uh, your thumbs up or your evaluation on uh, how we did today. I see a lot of hands clapping for uh, Paul, Tim, and Harman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer the survey, and then I have uh, some, some news as well to share. Thanks for the thumbs ups and the clap. I'm sure our panelists appreciate. <laughs> All right. And thank you for all the questions. That's great to see that uh, level of engagement throughout. There's never enough time. We know that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get to ask you about the Dana Monetization VP title and what you think about that, uh, having that as a title. We need to do another webcast again. Yeah. All right. Um, if, Atef, we can share the next few webcasts. So unless we hear from you on some topics that uh, you care about, uh, we would like to suggest the following one, uh, unlocking the potential of uh, um, the metaverse and, and web, web 3.0 would be in May. 
uh, exploring computer vision uh, when we're back, back to school in September. Uh, we're going to come back to the topic of data governance in the new world of, of data. Um, applying AI in ESG in November, and then imagining the future of work, the last question that we were talking about, we're going to dedicate our, our December webcast to it. Uh, so do sign up, do register, and let us know uh, if there's anything else that we can cover. Again, a big clap and a big thank you to Paul, Tim, and Harmon, and wishing you an excellent rest of the day.